Okay, so let's move on to the introduction. So, typhoid fever is a life-threatening illness caused by the infection with a gram-negative bacteria, Salmonella typhi or Salmonella paratyphi, that is usually foodborne and often associated with international travel. So, uh, typhoid fever is also known as enteric fever. It is called enteric because it starts from the gut and causes systemic illness with fever. And it is the major cause of morbidity and mortality. It is a food and waterborne disease, which means that bacteria is the, deposited in the water or food by a human carrier and it spread to other people. So the ideology. So it is caused by the bacteria Salmonella typhi, uh, which is a member of an Enterobacteriaceae family. So to give you a brief background of Enterobacteriaceae. So these are the largest and the most heterogeneous collection of medical important gram-negative rods. So these bacteria are typically found in water, in vegetation soil, and intestinal flora. So Salmonella species are gram-negative. They have flagella that help them move around and they are facultative anaerobic which means they can adapt whether oxygen is present in the environment or not. So the epidemiology. So this map shows the incidence of typhoid fever. So the dark red colors are the highest incidence including the Africa, India, Southeast Asia, and Central Asia. So current estimates from the World Health Organization suggest that the world worldwide incidence of typhoid fever is approximately 16 million cases annually with more than 600,000 deaths. So the, let's move on to the mode of transmission. So humans are the only reservoir of the bacteria. So it is spread from person to person via the fecal to oral route. So this is very, this is highly contagious and uh, this means that kanang okay. okay, so let's move on to the mode of transmission. So, typhoid fever is highly contagious and humans are the only reservoir of the bacteria. So, it is spread from person to person via the fecal to oral route. This means that most of the infected individual ingest bacteria from contaminated food or water and like many uh, foodborne diseases lack of proper hand washing is often the cause of disease so primary sources of infection include feces and urine of cases or carriers and the secondary sources include contaminated water food fingers and flies so the risk factors of typhoid fever are include the children and young adults because they are more susceptible for typhoid fever but it occurs at any age uh, travel to endemic areas um, another is overcrowding which can be easily transmitted if anybody's infected through direct or indirect contact and we have poor hygiene habits poor sanitation is also another risk factor and contact with someone that suffered from typhoid fever. So the pathogenesis of typhoid fever is that when these bacteria are ingested orally, they survive gastric acids due to their acid tolerance genes which allows them for same passage through the stomach and it enters the duodenum which is the first part of the small intestine. So ingested bacilli invade the small intestine, taken up by macrophages and transported to the original lymph node. So these uh, bacteria will actually penetrate and multiply the intestinal lymphoid tissue. And this invasion of the epithelial cells will trigger an inflammatory response causing tissue damage and diarrhea. So the bacteria can also uh, spread to the liver of spleen and bone marrow causing systemic, systemic disease. 
So the clinical manifestations of typhoid fever is that the incubation period is about 5 to 21 days after ingestion of bacteria. So the general symptoms of typhoid fever is fever and plus abdominal pain. So the stage 1 or the first week of infection or also known as the stepwise fever is that uh, we can where we can see a uh, slowly rising of temperature and we also have malaise, headache, constipation and relative bradycardia or slow heart rate. So the stage 2 or the second week of infection this is where we can see abdominal pain as well as what we call raw spots may appear on the upper abdomen and the back of the spars, uh, abdominal distension with tenderness, cough, and diarrhea. So raw spots uh, are usually about 1 to 5 millimeters in size and other, other symptoms we have diarrhea and cough. So in the third week of Infection, this is also known as the worsening of symptoms. So, these include uh, in the internal bleeding, intestinal perforation, and bleeding due to the proliferation of bacteria to the submucosa. We can also see the enlargement of the liver, liver and spleen, as well as we can notice uh, what we call diphoid encephalopathy, which causes altered mental status, confusion, delirium, acute psychosis, then we have coma or death if left treatment. So stage four or the fourth week is also known as the recovery period. So if an individual survives the fourth week, the fever, uh, fourth week, the fever and mental state and abdominal distension slowly improve over days. So intestinal and Neurologic complication may still occur in surviving and treated individuals. So, some of the survivors may become asymptomatic, uh, uh, which is uh, some of the lymphatic carriers and have the potential to transmit the bacteria indefinitely. Like, for example, the case of the typhoid Mary, a famous carrier of the typhoid bacterium who was responsible for the multiple outbreaks of typhoid fever in New York City in 1900. So her name was Mary and was uh, cooked due to her uh, improper hand washing and as well as lack of the knowledge of the disease. Uh, 51 typhoid cases and 3 deaths were directly attributed to her and she was immune and, and a carrier of the bacteria. So she's the famous case of typhoid fever. Okay, so now let's move to, to the complications. So the complications include perforation and hemorrhage we have, of the bowel. We have a bone and joint infection. We have meningitis and cholecystitis, which is the inflammation of the gallbladder. We also have myocarditis, we have, which is an inflammation of the heart muscles. We have nephritis and a persistent gallbladder carriage. So laboratory and diagnostic procedures. So we have blood culture, urine and stool culture to identify the specific uh, bacteria and treat it with the right antibiotic. So, and we also have bone marrow culture, which is a 90% sensitive unless until after five days commencement of antibiotic. We have also a culture of punch biopsy or samples of rose spots reportedly yield a 63% of 63% initial positive results even after the administration of antibiotics. We ha also have a specific serologic test which identifies salmonella antibodies and antigens. So specifically a vital test. Usually a uh, all antibodies appear on day six to eight and H antibodies on day 10 to 12 after the onset of disease. So, vital test is used for the diagnosis of typhoid and paratyphoid fever. So, this is a uh, rose, a culture of punch biopsy of rose box. So, so, this is the specimen collection based on the different phases of enteric fever. So, during the first week, we have 
uh, blood culture, which is which shows 90% sensitivity. We have second week, we have blood culture and physics culture. And the third week, we have vital test, which shows 80 to 100%. We have and blood culture, which is sixty percent, and this is eighty percent. So the medical management, so it is encouraged to have a rest. So the diet should be monitored. Make sure that the fluid and electro electrolytes are checked, and it is encouraged to have a soft diet in an absence of an abdominal distension. We should also need to emphasize a good personal hygiene and sanitation and practice proper food sanitation. So the pharmacologic management depends on the local resistant patterns. There can be different strains of salmonella type B. Some are multi-drug resistant and some are even extensively drug resistant strains. So that's so that's gonna tell us um, which antibiotic should be used but uh, generally, the drug of choice are the first line of uh, the first line are the fluoroquinolones, azithromycin. We have ceftriaxone or carbapenems, and antipyretics for fever. So surgical management. So surgery is usually indicated in cases of intestinal perforation. So most most surgeons prefer simple closure of the perforation with drainage of the peritoneum. And small bowel section is indicated for patients with multiple perforations. So typhoid fever prevention is hand washing, sanitation, and hygiene, especially it can be transmitted through food and water. Uh, drink clean, fresh, and water. We also need to clean fruits and vegetables thoroughly and a vaccination that will help prevent typhoid fever. So the nursing diagnoses are Risk for imbalanced nutrition less than body requirements related to loss of appetite and altered absorption of nutrients. So nursing management, we have monitor amount of nutrients and calories and monitor the client for weight loss, monitor intake and output, involve the family in client's nutritional needs, and collaborate with nutritionists to determine the amount of calories and nutrients needed for the patient. Next is risk for fluid volume deficit related to excessive fluid loss. The nursing management include assist signs for dehydration, monitor vital signs, monitor fluid intake and output, weight clients regularly, encourage to increase fluid intake, administer IV fluid as indicated, and administer medication as ordered. So, Last is acute pain related to infectious process secondary to typhoid fever. Nursing management include assess the level and characteristics of pain, the location, duration, and intensity. Monitor vital signs. Provide warm compression areas with pain. Encourage hydration. Maintain adequate nutrition and administer medication or analgesics as ordered. So the prognosis of typhoid fever is that with appropriate antibiotic therapy, most patients recover from the disease. However, 30% of people who do not undergo therapy will die. Most of those who got sick had failed to receive a vaccination prior to trouble. Typhoid fever kills hundreds of thousands of people annually each year. Most deaths occur in developing countries where disease is common. With adequate treatment, less than 1% of victims should die. There is a concern that multi-antibiotic resistant strains of bacteria are becoming more common worldwide. So that's why we need a uh, prescription from the doctor whenever we take antibiotics, as well as we need to finish the full course of antibiotics that was prescribed by the physician. <laughs> so I think that's it. Thank you for watching. Okay, so... The next topic that we are going to talk about is about typhoid fever. So we're also going to talk about the overview, the etiology, the mode of transmission, the risk factors, the pathogenesis, the clinical manifestations, the complications, the laboratory or diagnostic procedures, the medical management, the nursing diagnosis, and the prognosis.